Molly about the short camp for the invitation. I don't know if you remember, but we first met at my very first Gordon Research Conference. I think that was in 2007 or 2008 when you were the chair. Um, my very first one, and it got me hooked on Gordon conferences because you did such a great job. Um, also, it's difficult to come behind Dr. Balakrishna. I mean, wow. Um, and even that was a great layout, which allowed me to skip through several of my slides. So thank you all for participating, and it's great to be back in Toronto. I mean, however, at that field. Um, I do love the city. I've been there maybe three times. Um, and so thank you for having me. Um, but so um, today, you know what we'll be talking about, so I'll just jump right on in. Um, make sure this is going. So uh, my name is Manu Platt. I run the Platt Lab for Repair, Regeneration, and Remodeling. Um, we're in Atlanta, Georgia. There's a joint department between Georgia Institute of Technology and Emory University. So when things open up, come on down to Atlanta and visit us. But I study a few different things. Um, cardiovascular is my background, and I now have transitioned that to sickle cell disease, but more so looking at how children with sickle cell disease are at risk of strokes. Um, I used to do a lot of work with HIV and cardiovascular disease, which is tamped down a little bit due to funding, but I still stay up in the literature and think about these problems where uh, people with HIV are living longer, but they still are having increased risk of death due to cardiovascular disease. So what's happening there? And then I'm in a couple of other centers where we do EBICS, which is now developed multicellular engineered living systems, but also my own private lab, private lab. We do systems biology and predictive medicine, a lot around breast cancer. Um, but anyway, check me out. Here's our website. Here's my email address. Look me up. Um, but I have to show that, and we also have published a lot of different papers in a number of different fields. I really care about tissue remodeling, how you go from healthy tissue to diseased tissue, and what are these mechanisms that you can stop that with using uh, computational and experimental approaches, taking into account biomechanics, biochemistry, and the merging of those two. And I always have to talk about the science that I do because oftentimes people don't think that I am a scientist or a professor when I walk around into the regular world. And that's important then for me to claim all of my identities and that yes, a scientist looks like me. And that's one way that I try to diversify the sciences by saying you don't have to look a particular way to be counted as a scientist. But why am I here talking to you all about these other topics? Well, I've been black a long time, <laughs> at least 40 years. Um, but I also really, I went to a liberal arts college for my undergraduate degree, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm not from Atlanta, I'm from the Northeast, New Jersey in the United States. Um, and that was a great education because it opens your mind to lots of different things. So when I became a professor, actually five or six years afterwards, there was a group that was forming at Georgia Tech called this Race and Racism in Contemporary Biomedicine Working Group. And, and I joined this group, we got some funds from Georgia Tech to, to start it. And it really began to open my eyes to lots of other ways to think about science, society, um, policy, and how they all interact. And I present to you this image of several of the, the regular attending members. But you can see we cross several different uh, disciplines and also different institutions in the Atlanta metropolitan area. And the goal was really to think about how policy, racism, economic status, politics, psychology, all of these things influence the natural sciences and the way we treat them or how health problems or health disparities are propagated or can be solved. And it just continued to blow my mind in each of these meetings. And um, I still keep in touch with many of these individuals. So I encourage all of you, even though you're a natural scientist or an engineer, reach out to the other communities. And this, I was inspired to do this because of the HIV research community. It became quite clear earlier on when I began to participate in that community that they could not make the changes and the improvements they did for HIV AIDS if they did not partner with social scientists, humanitarians, and the rest, because your science is only as good as the people who decide to take it on. And so that really became a, a model for me of how to think about my own science. But I really, again, I'm in America, I'm a black American, so I wanted to always start off with the moment that we are in and what is this backstory? Because to some, this is brand new, like, oh, what's happening in America is new. To those of us that live here, especially those of us that are African-American, it's not new. Um, and so I just like when I talk to international groups, particularly even labs in my own institution where there's a large number of international students, I like to kind of give a little primer on it. And so um, as Molly mentioned, I gave this talk with the Gladstone called Gaslighting in the academy. I've changed the slides, but there's some things that you might see repeats of. But I did want to start with this um, succinct introduction by Kimberly Jones, who is an activist and an actress, who kind of captured the moment and describes the history. 
economics was the reason that black people were brought to this country. We came to do the agricultural work in the South and the textile work in the North. If I decided that I wanted to play Monopoly with you, and for 400 rounds, I didn't allow you to have any money, I didn't allow you to have anything on the board, I didn't allow for you to have anything, you don't get to play at all. Not only do you not get to play, you have to play on the behalf of the person that you're playing against. You have to play and make money and earn wealth for them and then you have to turn it over to them. And then we played another 50 rounds and everything that you gained and you earned was taken from you. That was Tulsa. That was Rosewood. Those are places where we built black economic wealth, where we were self-sufficient, where we owned our stores, where we owned our property, and they burned them to the ground. So if I played 400 rounds of Monopoly with you and I had to play and give you every dime that I made, and then for 50 years, every time that I played and you didn't like what I did, you got to burn it, how can you win? How can you win? You can't win. The game is thick. Turn down your own neighborhood. It's not ours. We don't own anything. We don't own anything. There's a social contract that we all have, that if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken. You broke the contract when you killed us in the street. You broke the contract when for 400 years we played your game and built your wealth. You broke the contract when we built our wealth again on our own by our bootstraps in Tulsa and you dropped bombs on us. When we built it in Rosewood and you came in and you slaughtered us. You broke the contract. Be enough. And they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. And so that's the, the speaker at the end that I show you. And, and it's and it's important to think about this in the context of this audience. And I appreciate again, Anita, starting with identifying the lands on which that we're occupying, because I don't discount this from what indigenous people have experienced. But I, again, my I'm only speaking on this from the black experience, because that is what I can speak on. Um, okay. So that's why this definition of gaslighting, and that's why gaslighting has started to come into the common sphere. And I really had not heard of it or thought of it until um, the last three and a half years. And just a quick definition, gaslighting is a form of manipulation that occurs in abusive relationships, an insidious and sometimes covert type of emotional abuse, where the bully or abuser makes the target question their judgments and reality. And ultimately, the victim of gaslighting starts to wonder if they are going crazy. And I, and I use this as a framework for what's been happening in America. But another guest like Canada is very different from the United States. So I had a great conversation with Molly and Anita and a few others as we were preparing for this conversation. And they really started to open me up to some of the things that are happening in Canada. Canada looks like the free land to us in America. Even now you can see lots of people are saying, I'm gonna leave America and go to Canada. Things don't turn out how I'd like. But that's a bit of a gaslight. Let's just, I pulled this clip um, from the idea that Canada is somehow immune to widespread racism. Listen to Doug Ford last week. Thank God that uh, we're different than the United States. And we don't have the systemic, deep roots they, they have had for years. And to Quebec Premier Francois Legault, who was either ignorant of history or chose to ignore it. I don't want us to compare ourselves to the United States. We have not experienced slavery in the history of the United States. Both eventually conceded racism exists, but their comments still reflect a lack of awareness about our own history. And I found this quite interesting in our discussion. And so some quick facts that I looked up, there were 200 years of slavery in Canada. Um, a few thousand Africans arrived in Canada in the 17th and 18th centuries as enslaved people. Then after the American Revolution, the British gave passage to over 3,000 enslaved people and free blacks who remained loyal to the crown during the battles. But then in 1793, the Upper Canada Legislature did abolish slavery. Okay, and so that's where Canada, of course, beat the United States in abolishing slavery. The U.S. was not until 1865. 
And then over that period, over 30,000 enslaved people came to Canada via the Underground Railroad. And that's kind of what has propagated in history that Canada was the end of the Underground Railroad and you make it to Canada and you will be free. But still things began to happen that were racist actions by the government. In 1910, the government of Canada implemented a new immigration act that barred immigrants into Canada from races deemed undesirable. And very few black people entered Canada during the next few decades. But then in 1967, which is again in parallel with the US civil rights um, fights, the government of Canada dropped the racially discriminatory immigration system after which black immigration rose dramatically. So that's why Anita's opening lays out many of these other facts in greater detail. And I also love her talking about this Truth and Reconciliation Commission. When I was doing a lot with HIV AIDS, I spent a lot of time in South Africa. For the sake of this conversation, I won't be able to bring that up, but their truth and reconciliation that they underwent at the end of apartheid are still things that the United States has not undergone and why we still remain a bit of a fractured society, in my opinion. But I'd like to take you back to several years ago um, where Colin Kaepernick, this is from 2016, kneeled on the field. And he was very clear about the reason he was kneeling was to uh, protest police brutality against black against unarmed black people and at the time the statistic unarmed black people were killed by police at five times the rate of unarmed white people five times the rate okay and i like to remind people i am black i'm a professor i hobnob with professors at conferences and other places but i'm black my mom is black my dad is black my brothers are black these are pictures of my brothers. My grandmother's black, my grandfather's black. So things that happen to black people happen to me. I'm not different than other black people. And I hear people say, well, you're different. I'm not. Police don't look at me as different when I'm driving in my car and they wanna pull me over or when I'm walking down the street or if I walk into an elevator with someone who's not black who thinks I might rob them. I'm black. And when you say things about black people, you're saying those things about me and about my family member. You see me in my professional setting, but I'm still black in this country. And I'm also the second oldest of six boys. So when I think about the fear that we have for black men, I'm not just concerned about myself. I am concerned about my brothers. I am concerned about my cousins. I am concerned about my father and my uncles. And this is actually my baby brother. This is an older picture, but he's now um, 18 and is a freshman in college right now. So these are real things. This is not an academic um, conversation for me. And that's why when we hear these gaslights from police officers in the United States that say things like why they killed unarmed black people is like, oh, I thought they were going to kill me. This is a gaslight. Why? Because look at the examples, both of them, John, I'm going to give you just a few because to go through all of them is impossible. Um, and it also just wears me down each time I discuss. Both of them, John was actually killed, shot by a police officer in his own home, resting. It was a woman police officer who broke into his house she said she thought it was her own apartment and she killed him while he was at home eating ice cream. Sandra Bland, we know Sandra Bland because this happens again, black people, not just black men. It happens to black women and, and black trans women are really at the greatest risk of violence in the United States. Sandra Bland was 28 when she was killed. She died in a jail cell. Now there's, they, the official finding was it was suicide in the jail cell, but why was she ever in jail? She was arrested for not using a turn signal when switching lanes to allow a police car to pass her. Then that police officer who she was allowing to pass her pulls her over for not using her turn signal. And then she dies in jail three days later. Philando Castile was 32 years old. This is the one if you remember, his fiance was live streaming it on Facebook when there was a, when he was pulled over by the police. He was not driving. He said, I have a, an, an armed a weapon in the glove box. I'm licensed to carry, and the police officer go ahead and pull it out. As he's pulling out the weapon that he told them about, the policeman shot him multiple times, live streamed on camera. His young daughter was in the back seat of the car. And again, his live, his fiance was face, uh, streaming it live on Facebook. He was a cook at the cafeteria, at, a, at an elementary school cafeteria. And he warned the police officer, as I mentioned, but that wasn't sufficient because they were afraid for their lives, right? But when you hear that as a gaslight, let's look at what the police also say, I was afraid for my life in other instances, which is the indicator that it's gaslighting. The Charleston Nine, these were nine parishioners who were worshiping at Mother Emanuel in Charleston, South Carolina. There were many others that were there, but then a young man comes in and shoots up the church and those nine actually lost their lives. White male who did that. They were able to find him. They knew that he was armed. They knew that he had automatic weapons. They knew that he used those weapons, but they caught him calmly, brought him to a calm arrest 
and then took him to Burger King afterwards. I won't say his name. He doesn't get all that in my presentations. We know the, the, the Parkland shooting that you all may have heard about in Miami, Florida, again, a few years back. In Miami, Florida, um, the shooter went into this high school and shot multiple students. And this is actually quite terrible. These are young high school people who will forever be in junior or senior high school. The cops later apprehended this person without incident. Without incident. They know he has automatic weapons. We can catch him safely. Unarmed Black people, we're afraid for our life. And then, again, recently in Kenosha, Wisconsin, during some of the protests um, here, you see there was this young shooter here who used his long gun and killed two people and injured one. 17 years old, he drove across state lines to protect businesses by killing people. And, where, and this didn't stop here, okay? His name is Kyle. He was safely arrested. And then they began to raise money for his legal defense. And our president and his groups supported Kyle Rittenhouse, who killed people in cold blood. Whew! And then we have these others that the police have killed as well. And again, George Floyd, who really started um, was a spark point because it was recorded. But let's not forget Breonna Taylor, this poor woman who was in her bed resting and sleeping. And this always breaks my heart because my best friends are thick black women and she looks like somebody that I would hang out with. It just breaks my heart. And there's a number of others. Ahmaud Arbery was in Georgia out on a run when he was hunted down by a former police officer and two of his friends at the beginning of the pandemic when we were told we should go jogging and get exercise and be outside. And it's dangerous. And no matter what they tell you, all these people and why the police killed them, they were take their lives, with, they, they were killed while they were living, period. We have all that together. James Baldwin said this years ago, to be black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage. But then I go to work because I have to do my job. I love my job actually. And all of those things of being a black American are still with me when I walk into my job, right? I'm no different than other black people. And so I, I published this recently, uh, We Exist, We Are Your Peers. I was speaking about, we must all ask ourselves these critical questions about our role in the persistence of racism in, the, in academia and its effect on our colleagues. And that's not just black professors, black students, black staff, um, all of these people that try to put this aside to get their job function. But this seemed like things were turning around because George Floyd protests sparked up all over the globe, not just in America. And this was quite exciting and reinforcing, like, whoa, they care. There's a question of they just now started to believe us, but still, we'll take it, right? This is globally, and you can see a number of protests broke out all over America and in Canada, and this is even in places where they had very, very few Black people that were residents, showing that maybe a sea change is coming. And people were in the streets shouting, Black Lives Matter, what used to be a curse word and a, a problematic term and controversy was now being supported in the streets. But then the gaslight was turned on because the election just happened. And yes, it looks like, sure, but Joe Biden is the president-elect, but look at how close the race was. 72 million Americans support the actions of a racist in office. People were out in the street. We all got excited. America's changing. But 72 million Americans said, but my, quote, economics is more important than the death and destruction of black and brown people, right? And this gives us all pause, or it should give us pause. And then when you look at the breakdown again, of course, white Americans, 57% supported Donald Trump. Power does not give up itself willingly. And this election has gone on to reflect that. And then COVID-19 is dropped on us. But in the midst of that, I saw this tweet from um, a, a young Black comedian, and she goes, being Black is having a good day, and then seeing another Black person was killed for no reason. So then you've got to think about that all day, or don't and numb yourself. It's a constant emotional war. While I'm supposed to still be doing work, while I'm supposed to be supporting my grad students during the, the quarantine and the isolation, and while COVID-19 has descended upon us. And why was this extra different. COVID-19 is a health disparity. And so when it first hit, everyone said, oh, biology, infectious diseases. We, I love this quote. I went to the AIDS 2020 meeting this year, virtual, of course, where it was like, we're all in the same boat. Dr. Celeste Watkin Hayes said, that's what people said. But that's not true. Some of us are in a little rinky dinghy boat. Others are in a nice fancy yacht to survive the COVID-19 pandemic. 
because it's a health disparity. And when you break down the numbers, black people are dying at 2.1 times the rate of white people. These are American and the United States statistics. But even we've lost 45,000 black lives to COVID-19, 20% of COVID-19 deaths, right? But, but the greater statistic, 109 out of 100,000, that means one out of every 1,000 black Americans have died of COVID-19. That's an insane statistic. But now what do we know in America? It's why racism, not race, is a risk factor for dying of COVID-19. And Kamara Phyllis-Jones, I'll feature her a little bit more later, but gives some great reasons why. And we can talk about the social determinants of health and other um, things in the discussion. I'm looking forward to that. But it also was that racism was a part, a part because even Black people who were wealthy were dying of COVID-19. The differences could not be explained by differences in income. And so these authors who published this work gave credence to the hypothesis that structural racism underlies the disproportionately high rates of COVID-19, alarmingly high rates of deaths in predominantly Black communities. And this, again, gets back to some of the Nita's earlier presentations about access to healthcare and treatment once one is in the healthcare system. But we've actually known this for a while because even being rich and famous doesn't save you from racial disparities, health disparities in the United States. And childbirth is a big one. Black women are at increased risk of dying of childbirth in America. Even rich ones, Serena Williams had a harrowing um, childbirth ordeal. And she is a fit athlete that is wealthy and that she still faced issues with the doctors believing complications she was taking on. And Beyonce also shared these stories. Beyonce and Serena Williams, if they are at risk of um, racism in the healthcare system, the rest of us have no chance, right? And so these are things that we take on and live with in America Daily. But when I talk about this racism and the difficulty that Black people have in this country, I need to be really clear. And I love this piece by Imani Perry in The Atlantic. Racism is terrible. Blackness is not. I love being Black. We have a great culture, a thriving, a, in, in a, a, an energy. And I just want to make that point clear. We need to fight the racism, not the Blackness. But if I show you these health disparities and what Black people have to deal with in this country with police, with health care disparities, so what? Those are not my people. Why should I care? And then when we talk about COVID-19, I'm young. Young people don't have problems with it. I don't need to wear a mask. I'm young, who cares, right? I'm tired of being cooped up in the house. I wanna go party. Well, here's what happens. And these are things I learned again about the HIV community when there was stigma against gay people, people um, who intervene as drug users. Oh, let them die, people in jail, let them die, who cares? No, that doesn't, that's not how you solve public health issues. And in America, as you all may be reminded, red are those that were more conservative or, or on the Republican end of the spectrum. Blue are the more liberal or Democrats is how we think about them. And so again, as you remember, the COVID outbreak broke out big in New York, Washington and Seattle, these blue states. And you heard people in the red states say, oh, we don't have to care, it's not affecting us. But watch how this changed over time. Blue states are dominating early on. And then you see more and more and more red states start to take on the greater burden of the disease in America. And it continues and it continues. And the statistics today have North and South Dakota with the highest new infections in America. This is why we can't just care about our own group. And it's the importance of allyship. And allyship goes out beyond just caring about health disparities, beyond just caring about police brutality. But I think it's also important that we all remember, we say, well, I got to look out for me and my people. Well, listen, we all have different axes of privilege. And as a Black American, yes, there's certain, I don't have white privilege, but I'm also a male. So I have gender privilege because the way America is set up now, being a male brings more privilege than being a woman. Um, there's, we always think about race and ethnicity privilege, but there's heterosexual privilege, height privilege. I'm 6'3". I have a lot of short um, graduate students. I always joke about that because they're so short. Right? Then I put reagents and things that I want on the top shelves in labs so they can't get to them. I use my height privilege. But if you also look at CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies in America, there's a large percentage of them that are over six foot one in height. So there are height things. Language privilege, those of us that run international labs in the United States, and uh, it, is a, it is a privilege to have English as a first language because people understand you easily and don't give you grief about your accent or whatever that means. So there's a number of axes of privilege that we need to think about. And it's important to recognize our privilege because we should then be allies for those who are not in that axis of privilege for us. 
So just to think about that, I want to kind of do this quick exercise. So those of you who are out there, if you can just pull out a piece of paper or use your computer or use a notepad, whatever you'd like, I just want you to make a tick mark if this applies to you, okay? So if you are a member of a racial or ethnic minority in Canada, just put a little tick mark down on the piece of paper. Okay, all right. If you are indigenous to this land, put a tick mark down on the piece of paper or if you're people or you're descendants of people indigenous to this land. If you have a chronic health condition, if you are an immigrant, if you have been enlisted in the military in any country, if you identify as LGBTQIA+, if you have had or know someone who has had COVID-19, If you have had or know someone who has died, well, you wouldn't have died of it, but if you know someone who has died of COVID-19, if you have a physical disability, put a check mark. If you have a mental or medical disability, if you're a first generation college student, meaning your parents or grandparents did not attend college, and you have, if you're a first generation graduate student or advanced degree, if you have been incarcerated in any country, if you do not speak English as a first language, if you have participated in a Black Lives Matter protest, if you do not have any Black friends, if you have ever had a Black supervisor, if you believe that science in the academy is a meritocracy, If you notice how many women are in a room when you walk in, if you notice how many minorities are in a room when you walk in, and if you were not concerned with results of the US presidential election. I put this last one up quite explicitly because it is a privilege to not have been worried who won the election because there were a number of us extremely worried and could not focus and function during the weeks, days leading up. And as they draw it out, it still continues to be a nag. But I do this because I want people to realize that there are all of these things that other people are thinking about that we may not be thinking about, that all influence the way we function and experience others. And that when comments that are made actually have an impact because you may make a comment about something that is deeply important to someone else. And we're not all of these things, but how many numbers of these are you, okay? And I wanted to share this video of Jane Elliott because it's hard, what we like when we think about allyship, you, you can't walk a mile in anyone's shoes, right? But we do want to bring back empathy and understand that human beings are human beings and human problems are human problems. And we can trust other human beings. But Jane Elliott, she was a former third grade teacher and she's been an anti-racist educator for years now. I mean, more than 30, 40 years. But she did this brown eyed, blue eyed experiment in her class where she took people who had um, blue eyes and put a green collar and made them the underclass or to feel like how minorities feel in America. And those with brown eyes were the kind of upper class or the majority or the white population in America. And I'd love to see these student responses. We'll just watch this for a little. Perception is everything. <clears throat> white people look vicious and ugly and non caring and cruel and arrogant and powerful and condescending and angry are you angry no oh good for you are you angry trying not, to. trying not to be now does that take a lot of energy yes yes are you holding it in yes yes and are you trying really really hard not to react to me yes yes and are you trying really hard not to look at me at the moment yes yes why because I don't want to make myself more upset. You don't want to make yourself more upset by looking at me. Yes. Right. Does that take a lot of time, a lot of energy? Yes. Yes. Is that hard for you? Yes. Could you develop an ulcer over this? No. You had to do it every day. What would happen to your blood pressure? It would rise. Yeah. If somebody stood over you and you knew it was going to happen every day? Or you expected it to happen every day? Or it happened when you didn't expect it to? <coughs> or it happened to your kids every day, after it happened to your mother every day. Now, getting right along, your hand is still up. You still didn't learn anything, did you? 
Didn't I just say when your hand is up, you are thinking of what you're going to say instead of what's being said? Didn't I just say that? Yes, you did. And did you hear that? Yes, I did. And did you decide that you were just going to do it your way? I was Wait a minute, you were on a roll yes, there for I a minute. Did. Yeah, thank you very yes, much. Yes, I now, did. Now, since you choose to not listen to others, what do you suppose we're going to do where you're concerned? Well, listen to me. Thank you very much. Can now, I what now I'm no, please? because you're still thinking of what you're going to say instead of what I'm saying. Now, getting right along. I heard what you well, were every, saying. You're doing it again. What you were you're saying. doing it again. I don't care. You're doing it again. It's wrong. You're you doing it again. Persecuted her for standing you're out. You're doing it again. Persecuted him for standing out. The only change that ever happens is when people <gasps> stand out and I was that bad. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. Are you in any physical danger here? Are you in any physical danger here? Is that girl in any physical danger here? Emmett Till was hanged by his neck after he was beaten almost to death simply because he said, made a statement to a white woman. Every time I do the exercise, there is a point at, at which I know I have made the point. And we could stop there, but you have to nail it down. And so it goes on longer than some people think it should, but you have to nail it down. People at this institution... You've made your point, you're right. Yeah, thank you very much. What is my point that I've made? That I, you can't make generalizations about any place because there's racism everywhere. That's right. And while it may be... Uh-uh. <coughs> uh-uh. No. 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 You don't come back in here until you've apologized to every person in this room. Because you just exercised a freedom that none of these people of color have. When these people of color get tired of, ra of racism, they can't just walk out because there's no place in this country where they aren't going to be exposed to racism. They can't even stay in their own homes and not be exposed to racism if they turn on the television. But you, as a white female, when you get tired of being judged and treated unfairly on the basis of your eye color, you can walk out that door and you know it won't happen out there. You exercise the freedom they don't have. If you're going to be in here, you're going to apologize to every black person in this room and do it now. I'm and sorry. the Latinos, every there person is of color. There's racism in this country. Bullshit! No, you're not gonna say I'm sorry there's racism. You're going to apologize for what you just did. I will not apologize because it Out. is not a matter of Out. race always. Out! Out! Out. <clears throat> now, is she choosing to leave? Yes. Yes, yes. she could apologize and stay. I won't play the wrong game anymore. It's not going to hurt us to apologize. Yeah, let's talk and about that. What's going on in this room alone? Once she leaves it, that's it. It's over with. Okay. They ain't going to hurt her. Is it going to hurt her? She, according to action, it is killing, it's killing her. Yeah. According to her action, it's killing her. I love the way that young lady cares. It ain't gonna hurt her. But that point that she hit home, that that white woman or the white female who had the issue could walk out of that room and just leave it all behind, right? Again, the racial oppression, right? Because there's still other parts of her identity that may be oppressed outside. And I love that that's a way that she's trying to get people to understand what is it like. And I love the relation to the health, to the health issues. If you are always worried about this, that might give you an ulcer, might raise your blood pressure, might give you other health outcomes. And this is why structural racism causes these health disparities in the system. And when we talk about diversity, what does it mean? Diversity is people. We are all different. You had so many numbers of those things that you identified on that series of questions I just asked you. Others had different. We're all different. There are axes that we try to measure it because these are things that we can actually you know, measure, but we're all different individuals. But what is inclusion? And inclusion is where it really gets to be important in how we can bring success um, to academic experiences, academic environments. Inclusion is feeling welcome and valued, that's the obvious part, but it's also having opportunity. Feeling as though you have the same opportunity as others. And so then when communities start thinking about like diversity, they we're gonna be diverse, but they aren't thinking about inclusion, it's a revolving glass door. People come in, you're bringing in all these different kinds of people, but they leave quickly because there's no opportunity. They're not feeling included with the group. If you have inclusion without diversity, well, this is easy. We're all the same. 
So everyone's happy because everybody's included because we're all the same, but you lack creative ideas or these other new inputs that you would get from being on a, a mixed team. And so that's why organizations should focus on both, sorry, diversity and inclusion. But I just also want to get into some personal actions, which again, Anita did a great presentation. I'm gonna zip through these a bit for the sake of time. Um, but microaggressions, as she described, I won't even relay this definition, are these small commonplace instances that one of us might say or do to another. That again, the person is left wondering what the statement meant and if that really happened. Microaggressions are a bit of a form of gaslighting, okay? So what are some realities in racial microaggressions in the workplace? Again, I'm gonna talk about racial ones. They might be gender-based. They might be ability-based. We all experience these in different ways. You're expected to speak forward on behalf of people of color everywhere. Hey, so I said this thing, I mean, black people are okay when I do this, right? I don't know what all black people think. I can tell you what I think. You're sometimes expected to be the barometer of racism. I mean, when I told so-and-so this, that wasn't racist, right? What if the answer is yes? <laughs> You're told that your colleagues are intimidated by you and are afraid to approach you. This happens all the time. I'm a tall black man, that is a danger in America. And some people who have a resting face that looks mean, whoa, right? Your absence at work, at meetings, at parties, stand out with no regard to how exhausting it is to be the only black person in the room. When I was in graduate school, uh, what I would do is when my white friends or colleagues or classmates would invite me to functions, I would plan to go to like every third because I wanted to stay on the invitation list, but some of their functions were just like, not my cup of tea and it was like, ugh, and I gotta go here and it takes more energy. But I don't wanna be excluded, right? Because it's exhausting. But they notice when I'm not there, right? You're encouraged to not think of yourself as black when you're the only black person in the room. And I really push back when people say, well, how, you know, oh, Mana, you're so unapologetically black. And I'm like, they know that I'm black. No matter what I say, how I speak, they know. So what am I hiding it for, right? And then this last one, you wonder how you can feel invisible and hyper-visible at the same time. Quite a conundrum, particularly around professionals, people who you think value you, your colleagues, classmates, et cetera. So then what can we do as people to kind of overcome our own biases or the way we play this out? I love this scene from A Time to Kill, um, an old movie now, it's, I can't believe it's 24 years old, it was Matthew McConaughey's Star Making Turn. And so this was a lawsuit or a, a criminal case in Mississippi, the book by John Grisham, where Matthew McConaughey is the white Mississippi Southern lawyer defending Samuel L. Jackson, um, who went and killed these white men who brutally raped and, and assaulted his seven-year-old daughter, okay? So this is McConaughey's final closing argument to the jury, because there was like, there's no way you're gonna win this case in Mississippi. And here's how McConaughey approaches this speech. Soaked in their urine, soaked in their semen, soaked in her blood, left to die. Can you see her? I want you to picture a little girl now imagine she's white Now imagine she's white, and that was a difference for people. If it happened to this black girl, whatever, but whoa, a white girl? That makes it wrong. And that's a tip that I use quite a bit, and I, I, I learned this, he did, Ted, did, he did me. Ted Conway was a former program officer at the National Science Foundation in the US, and he's, he has a physical disability, and I was the diversity director for our center, and we had done a great job of recruiting underrepresented minorities and women for our research programs. And, and Ted said, hey, Mama, you're doing great, but you're missing the third leg of the stool, people with disabilities. And I said, oh, well, Ted, we can't find any. He said, oh, they're out there. Uh, he said, well, what if, what if they can't do the science because their disability gets in the way? Or what if they make other people in the lab uncomfortable and it's kind of weird to have one around? And what if, and as I was asking these things, it was everything I was saying were things that people have said about black people in the past, or that things that people have said about women. 
And again, it's a reminder, we all have biases and that's why we need to check. And I said, oh, okay. Cause I would be pissed if somebody gave me those reasons about why they couldn't get black people into their program. And that is now the test that I use. If I find myself in a situation where I'm saying something or I hear someone else say something, I said, what if people said that about women? What would you think? What if people said that about students from China? How would that sound to you? And then people said, well, that would be wrong. Then if it's wrong for that group, it is wrong to say that about all groups. And that is something that I use. And so just to close this out, um, thinking about people who want to diversify their classes or diversify their faculty or want to diversify their programs. I've identified these boundary conditions between you and the diverse class, the diverse faculty that you want. Again, I've been leading recruitment and admissions in my department for five years, been involved for the last 12. Um, and I, we, I've seen our department move past these different hurdles with intentional practices. But the things that people will say, they're not getting a sufficient numbers of complete applications from black students or faculty. They're not getting sufficient numbers that get through the admissions committee or through the faculty search committee. Faculty are the ones doing this review, we can fix this. They're not getting, then even if they get accepted, they're not choosing to come to that institution. We can talk about why there. Or they're not getting placed into research labs. So it's tough when we get one of these students because we can't place them. Or then if they get into research labs, oh, we can't get them to pass qualifying exams. It's so difficult. And people say these as putting this blame on the students, right? But again, in my four years as chair of the admissions and recruiting, year one, I was learning the ropes. By year two, we had eight black students out of our incoming class of 40. And let me remind you, we are a ranked number two program in the country, biomedical engineering. Um, but we didn't get Latinx or Hispanic students at first go round. Three out of 10 came. Year three, we had to fix some things. We still got 20% uh, black and 20% Hispanic Latinx. We were able to correct it. And the same thing happened for year four. So these things are possible at a top rank program. But how? You've got to address implicit bias in the application review process. This means addressing it with your colleagues. And you have to be explicit about being anti-racist in the student selections. We can't allow entropy to drive who gets in. We're all fair reviewers and this is what we get. No. And that's why you have to orient your admissions committee, your faculty search committee, and your entire faculty and exercise oversight. You've got to be vigilant about this. And if you see some comments that are made that seem biased, they must be corrected and addressed. And even when the students visit or the faculty visit, I say faculty candidates, do not let students of color meet one-on-one -on -one with racist professors as much as you can help it. And if you have trouble identifying who are the racist professors when people say, oh, we don't know their heart, ask one of the students of color or professors of color, they'll tell you. And the same thing with sexist professors. If you have trouble identifying them, ask some of the women colleagues of yours. Ask some of the women students. They'll tell you. And so again, you have to overcome these myths that there are none out there and that we don't know where to find them. And they may not be prepared coming from those kinds of schools. I'm not sure what that looks like in Canada, but in the United States, that means historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions. They may not be prepared from those schools. That's bias. And so you need to bust these myths and then you can get the diverse class and diverse faculty that you're into. And the other thing to consider, what is your institution's reputation? If you're not getting the applicants that you think you deserve, how is your reputation projected externally? What statements are made in your admissions committee at the recruiting weekend or by your faculty in other public forum that people hear about and that spread? What does the broader educational community think about your institution or department and its support or destruction of black and indigenous talent. And black and indigenous people talk. Well, I know black people do. I don't want to speak for indigenous. That we're like, wait, you going to what school? You know they did they blah 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 to so and so and so and so, and they don't do this and they treat people like this. Word spreads. And these are things that need to address. And one way that you can address these things is increase the talent pool. If you say they can't find any, increase the pool. So I just want to end this with talking about this program we started called Project Engages where we started to bring in black students from um, high schools in Atlanta, Georgia, where Georgia Tech is located, and paying them to work with PhD students and, and postdocs and paying them $10 an hour to conduct research, to improve their resume. Many of these kids are first generation college students, so will be when they go to college, and some of them are even first generation high school graduates. So this is really turning around the economics for that family. This was started with my wonderful mentor and hero, Bob Neerum. Um, who recently who, who passed uh, early 2020 
So the, the reins have fallen to us, but we co-founded it, co-directed it. And Ms. Lakita Servants is the linking program manager that really keeps it going. Um, this is our most recent class. We did not take a class in summer 2019 because of COVID, but they started 2018, juniors and seniors. And again, it's impact beyond just the students. We've impacted the school district, the superintendents involved, Georgia Tech presidents are involved. But look at where these kids now have gone to university across the country. Again, many first generation, let me wrap this up. But it's not just our students, it affects the mentors. And the mentors don't look like our students in most cases. But they now learning how to overcome whatever bias they have of some um, young person, black person from a low socioeconomic high school that has the ability actually to do science and be creative and bring their ideas and be productive. And I thank my professors who took a chance and said, hey, we will take these young black students, high school students, into our research lab as well. Um, and there's a number of other things that go with that. But I do just want to wrap up with this last little piece from Kamara. No, I'll, actually, I'll save the last piece. I won't show the last piece. You can find it online. It's great because I do want to save more time for questions. But I did want to end with every person's Bill of Rights. My wonderful sister-in-law um, sent this to me years ago um, when she helped me prepare an assertiveness training for my lab. Every person's Bill of Rights. The right, everyone has the right to be treated with respect, period, regardless of any of those axes of privilege or diversity. We all have the right to have and express our own feelings and opinions. We have the right to be listened to and taken seriously. Taken seriously is really critical in that, in that phrasing. And you have the right to set your own priorities. This is important. I have this discussion with my grad students, particularly the new ones. You have the right to say no without feeling guilty. If you weigh the pros and cons and this is the best decision, say no. And don't feel guilty about it. Of course, you have the right to get what you pay for. We all have the right to make mistakes, particularly people from marginalized communities or from um, uh, marginalized genders who feel like I have to represent everyone and if I mess up, there will never be another. No, human beings make mistakes. We have the right to make mistakes. And then we have the right to choose not to assert ourselves. When we see inequities as a marginalized person, we don't always have to stand up if we feel it's unsafe, although there are times when we must. So thank you for listening. Looking forward to the Q&A and the discussion period and definitely with the um, Canadian perspective. Thank you.